In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. It will not have escaped anyone's attention, paying attention even for a fraction of the services yesterday, that it is the paradox of the event of our Lord's baptism that most interests the liturgical writers and the fathers of the church. How is it that John, who was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, comes to baptize the Lord Jesus, who has no need of repentance or forgiveness of sins. Something is amiss here. And credit to the apostles, the evangelists, for recording this event and keeping it even as it was a bewildering one, a confusing one, a one which maybe even caused some degree of embarrassment in the early church, the one that the apostles were preaching as sinless, as God incarnate, who received a baptism for repentance. What is this all about? And of course, it's only once we take that longer view and in light of the Paschal mystery, that this begins to make sense. God, who so loves us, that he desires to come and identify with us in the greatest place of our vulnerability and sinfulness and suffering, enters into a human being and suffers this to happen, that he should even be baptized in this baptism of repentance by John in the Jordan. It's only in light of the cross that our Lord's baptism makes any sense. The one who was willing to lay down his life for the, for the life of the world is baptized in the Jordan. And I want to just reflect on a couple of aspects of what that means about love, what that means about the way that God comes to us and shows us the way to love, of self-sacrificial love. The one who says of Jesus, this is my beloved son. And in Jesus, all of us are represented. And so the one who says to all of us as human beings that we are God's beloved. What does it mean that God loves in this way? The first is, of course, that although John is preaching that God is coming, the kingdom of God is coming, and it seems like there's going to be this great sweeping of the floor of history, that everything is going to be put right, everything is going to be sorted out, that when God does come, he comes like this, identifying not with a sweeping judge who's going to immediately put everything right, but identifying with those who are suffering. Where does he go in his incarnate life, but to identify with the very people who are in exile, the very people who continue to suffer, the very people who are in need, indeed, of repentance, of turning back to God. That's where he goes. That's where love takes him, to be that, kind of incarnate God. And that's really important for us. I think if we learn to love in God's way, very often we're invited or we have the opportunity to come into situations in this world where things are wrong, where things, where people are suffering, where there is some need of love to enter in. And we often, I think, take the notion that we need to go in and sort things out. We need to put things right. We need to give advice, perhaps, or take steps to rectify a situation. But when we, what is, in the first case, always needed is that we go to where love is most needed, which is to say, with those who are suffering, that we identify there, that we accompany and enter into situations with that love. Later, of course, Things can be put right, and God in his own time will do that. But it's instructive for us that love first goes there to those who are most in need and in suffering. And the second aspect of this that is worth reflecting on is that this kind of love 
is therefore rather risky. It takes great risk because, of course, it can be misunderstood. Our Lord comes to the banks of the Jordan and submits to a baptism of repentance. And that, of course, ultimately is this paradox that we have sung a thousand times in the last 24 hours. This paradox of the one who is sinless undergoing a baptism of repentance, the one who, who hung the earth on the waters, who enters into the water. A thousand different ways we've sung about this paradox. But a paradox isn't a paradox if it, in the first instance, doesn't make any sense. If in the first instance, it could be confused. It could be uh, misunderstood. And our Lord, in his love for us, allows for this. He takes this risk, he takes the risk that he could be accused of indeed just being a simple, sinful man. He, he takes the risk of the wagging finger, of, of the, the, the tongues that, that would speak of him in inappropriate ways. This is important for us as well, that love ultimately does not stop and weigh things up ahead of time and simply say, well, I'm going to calculate this. I'm going to arrange this so that it isn't misunderstood. Love just goes and acts, and love is without any sort of worry of what the world might think or say. And our Lord takes this risk. And it's going to take decades, centuries even, for that act on the banks of the Jordan to be properly understood and taught, and even still, it is the source of some consternation and confusion. It took us six hours yesterday of services to unpack the meaning of that paradox. Clearly, it needs some explication, but the love of God doesn't worry about that. The love of God, which goes to that place of suffering, takes risks. And so we too, if we are to follow in the path of our Lord, the, our Lord who comes ultimately to be baptized by the death, his suffering and death on the cross, and to rise again from that baptism in his resurrection and ascension. That Lord is a Lord who loves those who are most at need and who loves with this risky kind of love that doesn't worry about the world says. May we who celebrate this feast learn to love in this way. Amen.